Welcome to Daily Living with Father Chapin, where we consider God's Word and how we might be able to apply it into our daily living. Yes, my friend, that is what we do. Sometimes the Bible can be a bit confusing, so we bust it down. We're asking questions, questions like, what do these Gospels have to do with me? That's what I want to know. How can I take these Gospels and apply them into my daily living so that I can become a reflection of God's love? I want to be, well, a light in this darkness. I want to be a tool in the hand of God making present His kingdom, not someday, but today and every day, and that's what this show is all about. So glad you could join us today. Oh, we got a good one. What do you say we put ourselves in the presence of God? Because God's got a message for you today. We're going to school. Are you ready to be the student? We are hearing from the Gospel of Mark. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples said to him, where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? He sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man will meet you carrying a jar of water. Follow him. Wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, The teacher says, Where is my guest room, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. Make the preparations there. The disciples then went off, entered the city, and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. While they were eating, he took bread and said a blessing, broke it, gave it to them, and said, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, gave thanks, gave it to them, they all drank from it. He said to them, this is the blood of the covenant, which will be shed for many. Amen, I say to you, I shall not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Then, after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. The Gospel of the Lord. And what a gospel it is. Oh, there's a whole lot here, my friend. This is Daily Living on Father Chapin. You stick around. We'll be right back. And we're going to talk about this gospel and a few other things here as we consider God's Word and how we might be able to apply it into our daily living. Hi, this is Father Chapin, host of Daily Living with Father Chapin. It is such a pleasure to be able to come into your home each and every week and share the good news, but it's a bit expensive. So I would ask you to consider grabbing a piece of paper and a pencil, and at the next break, I'm gonna share with you some details how you can become a partner with Daily Living. And together, we can take the good news to a lost world. What do you say we get back to the show? Welcome back to Daily Living. So today we find ourselves in the 14th chapter of the Gospel of Mark and Calvary is looming on the horizon. Our gospel today picks up on verse 12, so let's set the stage. What is the context? Well, let's back up just a little bit to the first verse of the 14th chapter of the Gospel of Mark. The Passover feast of the unleavened bread were to take place in two days' time. So the chief priests and the scribes were seeking a way to arrest him by treachery and put him to death. So the him is Jesus. So the context is, is pretty dark. Because you see, Jesus, who had seemingly come out of nowhere, this man with no formal rabbinical training, this man who is the son of a carpenter, has captured the imagination of the nation of Israel. He's healing the sick, he's giving sight to the blind, he even is raising the dead. So all the while, he's preaching this radical message of hope and conversion to the people. And he is attracting huge crowds. People are starting to pay attention to this man from Galilee which is becoming a major problem for the religious leadership of Israel because, well, he seems to have zero respect for the traditions of the elders. 
He seems to have zero respect for Mosaic law, and he doesn't even seem to keep the most basic rules of the Sabbath. So, like I said, he's a major threat. He's a major problem. He, 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 he is against everything that the leadership currently stands for. So they want him dead. In short, he is a wanted man. Now, you add on top of this that we find ourselves in the middle of Passover, which, of course, is the major feast for Judaism, and everybody's in town, so it's crazy. I'm talking thousands of pilgrims from all over streaming into Jerusalem for this feast. So every room, every basement, every closet is full. So while they might be looking for Jesus, given the crowds, finding him is almost impossible. But that doesn't stop them. They're still looking for Jesus because, like I said, they want him gone. So that would mean that those who are traveling with him, namely the disciples, are in peril as well. So that is our stage. There's a lot of fear, and today we find our vagabond troop, and they're on the run. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when they sacrificed a Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where do you wish for us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? He sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the city and a man will meet you carrying a jar, a water jar. Follow him. Wherever he enters, wherever he goes, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room? Where I may eat the Passover with my disciples. Then he will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready, make the preparations there. So. Before we go any further, let me just say that our lesson today can be broken down into three different parts. And our first lesson comes from what we just read. And that's the fact, as clearly demonstrated from what we've just read, that Jesus has power. He has the ability to see into the future, see it all, and see it very clearly. And what does he see? Details. That's what he sees. And that's our first lesson today. When the circumstances in your life seem impossible, Jesus always has a way. Not only does Jesus have a way, he's already worked out the details, which is a good thing to keep in mind when you find yourself in a difficult situation. But of course, we have our side of the street, and our side of the street requires two things. Number one, it requires trust. Number two, it requires a willingness. So these are the two questions that we need to be asking ourselves. Number one, do I trust Jesus? And number two, am I willing to follow him? I mean, you can complicate this as much as you want, and trust me, many have. But it all comes down to those two questions. Do I trust Jesus? Am I willing to follow where he leads me? I mean, that's it. And that's our first lesson. Jesus has power. In other words, Jesus is Lord, which begs the question, is he your Lord? Because let's be honest, so many of us desperately want Jesus as our Savior, but not as our Lord. So let's move on. Now, for whatever reason, and I don't know why, but for whatever reason, sometimes the Gospels that present themselves in what we call the Liturgy of the Word skip verses. Like I said, I don't know why, and that's okay. It's not, it's not for me to understand everything. It's not for me to question. People much smarter than me put these things together. But sometimes, and it's certainly the case today, the gospel skips verses that, well, I, I'd kind of like to talk about. So, like I said, today we're in the 14th chapter of Mark, and we have read verses 12 through 16, and then skip to verses 22 through 26. So, let's back up and pick up with verse 17. When it was evening, 
he came to the twelve, and as they reclined at the table, they were eating. And Jesus said, Amen, amen, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Then they began to be distressed and say to him, or among each other, surely it was not I. And he said, one of the twelve, the one who dips with me into the dish. For the Son of Man indeed it goes, for it is written of him. But woe to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would be better for that man if he had never been born. Now, I'm fairly confident we all know who he's talking about here. Oh yeah, Judas. Just the name, Judas. Have you noticed, not too many mothers name their children Judas. I I've never met a Judas. I mean, that would be a tough name to go through life with, don't you think? Can you imagine being named Judas, the man who has gone down through history as the one who betrayed our Lord? And of course, throughout the centuries, we've judged Judas pretty harshly. Judas, how could you? So let's talk about this man, Judas, this man in the middle, this man that for some reason they decided to skip over. Who is Judas and what exactly was his crime? How did it begin? Well, to answer that question, let's return to our two questions. Do I trust Jesus? Am I willing to follow Jesus? Because obviously, somewhere along the way, Judas lost his trust in Jesus. Somewhere along the way, he lost his willingness to follow Jesus. Somewhere along the way, he walked away from Jesus. And we don't know exactly how that all happened. I mean, we can speculate. What do we know about Judas? Well, we know that not only was he a disciple, he was one of the apostles, the original band of brothers, one of the twelve. We also know that he was in charge of the money, which in that world, as it continues to be in this world, brings power. So I imagine Judas saw himself as a pretty important guy, you know, inner circle of the inner circle. And we can assume that Judas was completely convinced that Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah. But of course, and we've talked about this many, many times, he had a very specific idea of what a Messiah was supposed to be. In the mind of Judas, Jesus was going to start a revolution. In the mind of Judas, Jesus was going to lead the nation of Israel into battle against the Romans and clean house with the corrupt leadership. That's what he's thinking. And I imagine he probably thought that he was going to ride those coattails all the way to the top with Jesus and be his right-hand man. Maybe even in charge of the treasury of the entire nation of Israel. So when Jesus starts talking about how he's got to go to Jerusalem and die, well, that doesn't make any sense, because guess what? Messiahs don't die. This is Daily Living. I'm Father Chape, and you stick around. We'll be right back, and we will continue to talk about this amazing gospel that comes to us here as we consider God's Word and how we might be able to apply it into our daily living. Hi, this is Father Chapin, host of Daily Living. If you feel like you're being fed by this ministry, I would ask you to prayerfully consider a partnership with Daily Living and what we're trying to do here. A monthly gift of any amount that you feel comfortable with and I will send you a monthly newsletter and if you provide an email address, a script of the show prior to its broadcast. Just write a check to Daily Living, P.O. Box 339, Nitro, West Virginia, 25143. You can also go on the website at mydailyliving.com and give through PayPal and together we can shine the light of the good news in a whole lot of dark places. What do you say we get back to the show? Welcome back to Daily Living. Now just for the break, we were talking about the expectations of Judas. We were talking about the hopes, the dreams, and the desires of Judas. What Judas wanted what Judas was thinking, and it was not lining up with the reality of Jesus. So Judas, you know, he, he can tell which way the winds are blowing. What started off as hopeful 
was beginning to turn real dark as Jesus has alienated himself from the religious leadership of Israel. Not only was he not trying to endear himself, it seemed that he was taking every opportunity to provoke them. So understand, we're just talking here. I don't know. This is just a theory. I could be wrong. Probably am. But what if, maybe, Judas saw himself as a peacemaker? You know, a deal maker. Maybe he saw himself as somebody like in the, the middleman who could get into the middle of the situation and, 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 and maybe, maybe work things out, you know, you know, his way. And, and he, had a, he had a great backdoor clause because if it all fell apart, well, then he would be able to give the necessary nudge to Jesus to kick off the revolution. Because clearly, Judas was looking at the menu and had decided to not order. Figured he might manipulate the circumstance, you know, more his way. But of course we know that his plan went horribly wrong. In fact, he felt so badly about it that in the end, he ended up throwing the money back into the faces of the men who killed him, killed Jesus, and then went off to hang himself. So this is clearly not about money. His crime was not greed. His crime was walking away from Jesus. For the Son of Man it goes, for it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would be better for that man if he had never been born. My friend, this is a chilling warning for us because, let's be honest, so many of us find Jesus in the middle of our lives. We claim Jesus as our Savior. But then when circumstances present themselves where we don't like what's on the menu, we walk away from Jesus. We lose our trust in Jesus. We lose our willingness to follow his path as we turn to the fruit that this world offers, a fruit that binds us, a fruit that deceives us, which brings us to our second lesson today. We are Judas. Every time we walk away from Jesus to practice our habitual sin. So let's move on. While they were eating, he took bread, said the blessing, broke it, gave it to them, and said, take it, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it to them, and they all drank from it. He said to them, this is the blood of the covenant, which will be shed for many. Now, these verses represent what we as Christians call the Last Supper. But perhaps a much better name for it would be the Last Passover or the New Covenant. We need to understand that these verses are very much tied to the Jewish Passover, also known as the Feast of of the unleavened bread. So to truly understand what's going on here, we need to truly understand exactly what the Passover or the Feast of Unleavened Bread is. So let's begin. Well, first of all, Passover, as I had noted earlier, is the biggest feast of Judaism for the year. Passover for the Jewish faith is what Easter is for the Christian faith. And once again, those two things, Easter and Passover, are very much related. Passover commemorates the story of Exodus. Exodus is a book in the Hebrew Scriptures, or the Torah, a book that we as Christians refer to as the Old Testament, which is a bit of a misnomer because I can assure you that to Judaism, there is nothing old about it. Now, some people through the centuries, have mistaken 
well, they have this mistaken idea that the Old Testament is for the Jews and the New Testament is for the Christians. And that's wrong. In fact, they have a name for this. It's called Martianism, which goes by another name, heresy, meaning that the church has declared Martianism, this idea that the Old Testament is for the Jews and the New Testament is for the Christians, as a false teaching. Because, my friends, never let us forget, we are Judeo-Christians. What that means is that Christianity was born as a radical splinter sect within Judaism. Because I know this might come as a surprise to some, but Jesus was Jewish. In fact, not just a little Jewish, very Jewish. But getting back to the Passover. It celebrates the book of Exodus. What happened? And in case you've never read that book, which I would suggest, you definitely take the time to read it. What happened to the book of Exodus was that the people of Israel were taken into captivity by Pharaoh the king of Egypt, and they lived in captivity as slaves. And they were forced to make bricks for Pharaoh so that the Egyptians could build things. And in their captivity, they cried out to God, and God heard those cries. And he chose Moses to lead them out of this slavery. So in doing so, he sent ten plagues upon Egypt. And without going through all ten, that last one is the one that really did it. The last one, God sent the angel of death over the land of Egypt to kill the firstborn male of every animal and every person, every people. So he wanted to spare the Israelites, so God commanded Moses to tell his people to get ready for this angel of death by preparing a special meal of a lamb. They were instructed to eat this lamb as a people prepared to leave in great haste. Now God also instructed them to take the blood from this lamb and sprinkle it on the doorpost as well as the door frames of their houses so that when the angel of death flew over to kill the firstborn of the Egyptians, it would pass over their homes, and they would be saved. Well, this finally, this plague, the angel of death, it finally got Pharaoh's attention, and he relented and let Moses lead the people of Israel out of Egypt into freedom. But then he changed his mind, and Pharaoh sent his army to recapture the Israelites. So they're running away from this Egyptian army and they get to the Red Sea and God parted the waters to make a path for their escape. And once they got to the other side, God allowed those waters to flow back and drown the Egyptian army that was in pursuit. Okay, so I know that's a lot, but bear with me, it's important. When Jesus says, take this all of you and drink from it, for this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new covenant, which will be shed for many. What he is saying to his disciples, which by the way, if you call yourself a Christian, is you. What he's saying is that the blood of the Paschal Lamb that causes the angel of death to pass over and save them from death is him not only just for them, but for many, and the many is us. Because understand, my friend, what happened in Egypt so long ago continues to play out in our world today, right here, right now. Because you see, Pharaoh in that story is Satan today. We are captives as we continue to make for Satan our bricks of habitual sin. Jesus is our Moses, leading us out of that bondage. And the waters of the Red Sea that they pass through to escape are the waters of life that we pass through in baptism. 
And of course, the promised land is eternal life in heaven, which brings us to our third lesson today. Remember those three. The first one was Jesus has power. Jesus is Lord. Begging the question, is he your Lord? The second lesson was all about Judas, the one that walked away, and how we walk away every time we choose our will over his, our path over his path. But now we have come to the third and final lesson, and my friends, we have saved the best for last, because the third lesson is the promise. Because what Jesus said to his disciples that day, this is my body, this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant. I am your Passover lamb that will free you from death. He is saying to you today, right here, right now, I will come to you. I will put my spirit in you and I will take you home. Oh yes, Jesus wants to take you home. That's the promise. Are you willing to trust in Jesus today? Are you willing to follow the path that he's laying out for you today? If so, he will deliver you from the bondage of your habitual sin and bring you to the promised land of eternal life. You know, every day in this country, somebody does something nice for somebody else. Today, why don't you let that somebody be you? Because the best vitamin for a Christian is B1. This is Daily Living on Father Chape, and hope you can come back next week and we'll do it again. Until then, I hope you let God live in your life, and I bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.